Hi, this is Justin Clutty of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining us for this week's podcast. And we have on a super special guest, a guy named Manny Marroquin. Manny Marroquin is probably, I think, one of the biggest mixers of the 21st century. And we're going to be talking about a few things in today's episode. Of course, we're going to talk about his process and his techniques and some of the tools he uses and all that stuff. But Manny's career is really interesting one because just as there were declines in the early 21st century in record sales, the same time when there was upheavals in the studio world, Manny's star was rising just as there was so much change in the industry. So I think he's a great guy to talk to. He started as a studio runner very young in his career, worked his way up to major mixer. And a lot of people don't know this about Manny, but also studio owner. And he has some other music-related business ventures going on. I really want to talk to him about kind of career development in the 21st century for people in audio and music and approaching your craft, not only as the art and craft it is, but also as a business. And I couldn't be more thrilled to have on a guy like Manny Marroquin to talk about that with. Manny, thanks for being here. Thank you, man. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. All right. For those of you out there who aren't familiar with Manny just by name or just need a refresher, I think he's a guy whose reputation precedes him, but he has worked with artists like Bruno Mars, Whitney Houston, Rihanna, Vampire Weekend, uh, Imagine Dragons, John Mayer, uh, Tupac, Pink, Maroon 5, Shakira, Rihanna, Ludacris. So it's like all over the map. I mean, there's hip hop, there's R&B, there's rock, there's alternative, but I think everything there is, especially when Manny touches it, sonically interesting and pretty big. So... Congrats on working with so many cool artists, first of all, dude. <laughs> oh, man, thanks. You're really good for my ego. So uh, anytime you want to just keep blowing my ego and feeding my head with stuff, keep going, please. I will stop. do it. I, I'll do it. I'll do it for myself, too, because <laughs> okay, now, okay. of all the things you've done in your career, the coolest so far, Sonic Scoop Podcast. You're welcome. Yes. Thank yeah. you for being here. And in addition, <laughs> I've got to shout out the sponsors on this illustrious and awesome podcast that has people like Manny on. Sponsors for this week, Sound Toys. Big thanks to Sound Toys for being a sponsor of this podcast. Uh, Sound Toys making some of my favorite plugins. Try out anything they make for free over at soundtoys.com. They make a whole bunch of cool stuff. Another company making both software and hardware effects would be Eventide, Eventide also sponsoring this podcast. Big thank you to those guys making not only software and plugin effects, but killer hardware for like the past 30, 40 years. And last, certainly not least, sponsoring this podcast is Plugin Alliance, their first time sponsoring this podcast. So many amazing brands are under the umbrella there at Plugin Alliance, from Alicia to Brainworks to SSL to Mag Audio. Brainworks making some of the most interesting stuff over there. We've got this great kind of mid-side processing, doing things that really only plugins can do. Check out anything they make for free at pluginalliance.com. That's actually plugin-alliance.com or just type in Plugin Alliance in the Google machine. Check them out. They're actually having a big summer sale right now if you're listening to this as this episode is coming out in the month of June. And last but not least, you guys, if you want to become a supporter of this podcast, I encourage you to do so. You can go to sonicscoop.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash sonicscoop. Become a supporter of this yourself and get major discounts on all of our courses, eBooks, special perks, behind the scenes stuff with me and a lot of the guests. And enough about all that. Also, these guys aren't a sponsor. I'm giving them a shout out anyway. If you want plugins that have Manny's face on them, you can get them from Waves. Not a sponsor today, but got to give a shout out. Come on. This is a guy whose face is on a box of plugins. We got to talk about that. <laughs> so thank you again for being here, Manny. How are things in sunny LA? Man, uh, great. Not so sunny as of late, but, uh, you know, it's been great. Uh, I love, love, love being here. I love being in the studio. Currently in my room right now, about to attack this mix. But I was really excited to be on your show, man. I'm, uh, you know, I'm here supporter from day one so i was excited to uh to be invited to this because i think we can sh talk a a a about a lot of fun things and uh both business and creative so i'm excited to share yeah well one thing i want to jump right into is you are a guy who i mean like i said you've come up really in the 21st century but you did it in a somewhat old school way where you started as a runner in a studio and now you are part owner in a studio. First of all, did you ever, was being a studio owner ever part of the plan and how did that come about? 
No way, man. The studio business is not a good business for anyone <laughs> out there. <laughs> At one point, you know, the recession, right? I feel like we're survivors of that 13-year recession that happened in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Finally, we're starting to see something positive happening with uh, DSPs and streaming and all that. But, you know, when uh, when the, the Titanic, right, was, man, the ship was sinking. And uh, a lot of people wanted to get out of an amazing, amazing business before and the model was changing so at one point it was uh i've been at larabee studios for geez over 20 plus years and uh uh at one point the owner wanted to get out and i'm like wait a minute this is my room i make so many records here some have been big and some not but i have been my favorite and this is home it's like it's like someone you know you're you living in this house and someone selling the house and you got to move and you're like wait a minute i raised my kids here no i can't just leave can't ask me it's got to be on my terms so it really just happened by accident you know it just you know just the need to keep my studio because i knew if if he sold it i mean that was it anyone could ask me to leave so it was more a necessity than anything else to be honest with you never had the desire to go in the studio never was on my radar i always thought hey you book a studio or you build a studio at home you know then mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and it, it just kind of grew from there you know i just i, I always it, i always said if i did ever have a studio i kind of had a vision for it as well uh and that happened very organically very very organically yeah now i hadn't realized you'd actually been at larrabee that long about 20 years was that the first studio you were ever at or are there others before that no, you know, the, my very, very first studio where I could say, oh, I had a room, at, you know, uh, was this place called Skip Sailor back in the day. And we would book it out for like a month at a time. And and then from there, I had a very short time at Record Plant where I was booking it all the time. And then I went to Track and Place, which is at the time was Babyface's studio. <clears throat> and then uh, and then came to Larrabee shortly after that. So it's been, you know, yeah, it's been at least 20, I keep saying 20 years for the last few years. So <laughs> somewhere around there. Yeah, I, I get it. it I, you know? I keep on telling people I just turned 30, so I, I totally get it. <laughs> That's right. You look good, man. <laughs> well, uh, I'm closer to 40 now. But anyway, enough about me, more about uh, you making records. Uh, you started in a way that was around analog consoles, and you're still on an analog console today, right? At Larrabee, that's part yeah, of your setup. Yeah. Can you tell yes. me just how the technology aspect of it has evolved over the years for you? I mean, you've been doing this since before the year 2000, but the bulk of your career has taken place in this digital age. You're a guy who has his face mm -hmm. on a box of plugins. So how has, <laughs> have the tools that you've been using evolved and responded to the, the way that the business has changed over these years? You know, it's, it's crazy because a lot has changed, but at the same time, not much, if that makes any sense. Before we had, um, it was it was different. It was a, a different type of create a creative process. Where, for example, we would uh, work on drops. For example, if you, you have you had a drum loop and then you needed to build, you know, dynamics, and we do drops. Well, oh, let's drop the kick. The drums here. Oh, let's drop the uh, the guitars. It was almost like adding arrangement to it. And then doing like fancy vocal delays and reverbs and a lot of ear candy that was done that that people could never do in pre-production, right? And we spend a lot of time doing that stuff. Nowadays, it comes as is. Nowadays, I spend, you know, no time doing drops, you know? And if I ever do a drop, they will ask me, how come you dropped the kick there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> if if we wanted a, a no kick in that, we would have done it ourselves. And they're a hundred percent right mm -hmm. because they're they have the tools today that we didn't have 20, 25 years ago. So now it becomes a different sort of approach as a mixer. Now it's uh it's about emotion, more emotion than the actual arrangement of the track, which which is so different, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time. We were both, at least I was going for an emotion back then as I am now, today. So for me, it, it almost becomes a different part of the brain to make, you know, to, uh, I don't know if you can curse on this show, but <laughs> to almost mind fuck the listener into mm -hmm. thinking, oh, we're, you're taking us on this almost th this roller coaster of emotions. Some may be a tiny roller coaster and others um, a giant one. So, so we're really shaping sounds and frequencies 
so that the, that song has some type of emotion so that by the time you're done with those three and a half minutes, a lot less nowadays, uh, you want to hit replay. You want to hit, you know, you want to play it over and over again. And I think the psychology of that is really important for us mixers to understand what makes you feel something and why you would hit rewind and why you would play it over and over again. Where before we didn't even think about that, you know, but the essential, the, the foundation of it was just to make something feel a certain way. It's funny because we're mixers, so people think we we want to make things sound better, which, you know, we are. But uh, but the majority of the time, I feel like we're really trying to make something feel a mm. certain way. I remember records I mixed sorry, uh, 15, 20 years ago. I remember, I remember trying to sound, quote, sound good, right? Mm-hmm. And then I remember records I felt a certain way. And I, I play those records today, and I get the same feeling that I did back then. But the, the, the records that I try to make sound better sound dated, you know? Right, yeah. So follow your gut, man, and, you know, follow your gut and make it emotional. Make it yeah. sell the Eskimo a fan, as Method <laughs> Man would say. <laughs> That's huge, man. I, I think there is a big distinction between sound and feel. And with sound, I think a lot of people early on in their careers are, are chasing that, you know, the, the glossiness. How do I get this kick drum to impress other recording engineers? But when it comes <laughs> to guys who are really great at mixing, it is about like the arc of the tune, like what kind of journey is it taking us on? Ideally, if they've arranged it well and written it well, there's an arc in the tune to begin with. But, you know, finding that, capitalizing it, making each of those sections pop helping the listener find their way through it and in very rare occasions maybe helping them whittle out uh, some of the fat unless they like you said sometimes call you back and say hey why did you whittle that out we want that in there but so you're you're helping uh reinforce the arc that they've created and man that is huge and uh oftentimes the records that really impress people don't have to be the most hi-fi ones they are the most fun ones you know or the most memorable ones so yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really well said. So the console that you're working on has it been pretty much the same console as uh, as you've been working on for years? And how have you adapted to this new environment where people expect recalls all the time since you're on such a an analog focused system? Yeah, so I'm an SSL guy. I've been using SSL since, geez, I was 16, 17. Uh, at Larrabee in my in Studio Two here, Larrabee Lair- North, uh, back in the day, I've gone through a G. A- and then I got a J, and now I have a K. Right. The K for me is my probably my favorite one so far. The G's compressors were my favorite, but then I didn't like you know certain things about it. And it's an old technology as well. It's hard to keep up, you know. And, you know, it's, they they not not break down, but they're very finicky. So <clears throat> the K, since it's a little newer technology, I'm able to. I don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, any of the. Uh, the sticky buttons or faders not working or EQs busting out. And so I think for me, it's old school mentality of performing a mix. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not interested in analog versus digital conversations. To me, it's just colors. It's like arguing red is better than blue. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, that's fine. You like blue, I like red. So <laughs> for me, analog and digital, I, I'd like to take more of a naive approach to it and say, well, does it work with, with what's around it? Yeah, I, 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 I think that does it feel a certain way? People that come from an analog world, it does have a different feel. But today they're like, oh, it's so dark, man. It's not exciting enough, right? So our ears have adapted to this new sound now, which is not as it used to be for so many reasons, right? So for me, my approach on a console is just basically I can multitask. I can show, I can do 20 things in 10 seconds. And I'm talking about literally 20 things in 10 seconds mm. with EQ, compressor, levels, three, four different levels, da, 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 in 10 seconds, where if I was only in the box, I could only do one at a time. Yeah. So uh, that's the biggest difference for me, workflow. And then, you know, I'm big, I talk a lot about left brain, right brain approach. So for me, is when you're, when you have that sort of, burst of creative juices flowing and that can last from a minute to hopefully a few minutes or hours if you're lucky then you need to get that out of the way and if you hear a song and you're trying to mix it a certain way getting those ideas out as quickly as possible is really important 
So for me, that's why my workflow is still, you know, really, really, really big part of it is having a console and so something tangible in front of me that I can, you know, that I can move rather quickly, qu quicker than if I was just using a trackball or a mouse. Right. No, that's a great point. And I think a lot of people who came up on a trackball or a mouse or maybe a little motorized fader ha have an experience really working on an analog console might not realize just how fast you can become, just how much of an instrument it is mm -hmm. once you're good at one. But that said, you do save potentially a lot of time on the front end. You're able to make decisions more instinctively, more quickly. But on the back end, whenever someone needs changes, that's where it can become a little bit more laborious. So have you developed a good system for that? And is it just working with stems or is it anything more ornate than that? Yeah, you know, with the uh, with the S with the SSL here, the K, I, I'm able to uh, print stems, and still I can drive my tube, uh, my compressor a certain way, and still get that sound. For example, if I'm not, you know, if you if you're hitting it pretty hard and you're doing four, five, six dB of reduction on the SSL bus compressor, you know, if you're printing stems and you're soloing a hi hat, it's gonna react completely different. It's gonna have a different different type of glue, right? So I, over the years, we came up, not, not came up, we realized on how to print stems and keeping the glue and the compression the same. And that mm -hmm. to me changed everything because now I can print stems and if somebody has, you know, everybody, everyone has a comment nowadays because they know they can, <laughs> as opposed to back in the day, yeah. oh no, no, that's, we'll, li we'll live with that hi-hat being the certain way because that's gonna be half a day of recall and then we gotta pay you another half day and oh, it's gonna cost way too much. It's great the way it is, right? <laughs> nowadays, it, you know, we, some people, I'm, sh I'm sure some, a lot of engineers are doing dozens of revisions, right? Yeah. It depends. I feel like clients either run out of time or run out of money. <laughs> you know? Some of them, right? So f for us, we've developed this system where now, now once I'm in, I'm in the stems, ran through all kinds of analog equipment, now, now I can just pull up the stem and work in the box. And that's so much easier because I Honestly, I haven't done a recall in years. I, I can think of one in the last three years, you know, and that's my workflow becomes very, very, you know, we got a good workflow because we don't recall. Uh, everything is now in the stems, in the box. And now when the client asks for stems, we, we've already printed them. So we're ahead of that game too. So Beautiful. Uh, it's nice to know you can, yeah. you can adapt to modern demands without having to entirely change the toolkit, which is a great thing. Yeah, yeah. I, definitely, we have enough nerds uh, uh, like me listening to the show that we have to talk <laughs> more about the, the technology and the process uh, and the craft. Before we get into it, I do want to ask you a couple more questions on this, uh, this whole business idea. So clearly, when you became an owner in the studio, the studio was having trouble, right? This was around, like you said, Great Recession. Things weren't making sense for the owner anymore. And he was like, I got to sell it to somebody. And you said, rather than sell it to somebody else, why not sell it to me and some others internally in the business? I'm imagining that's what happened. Give me yep. additional details. That's but exact, yeah. the big question I have is, what did you do to help turn the business around and make it sustainable? Was it having different expectations? Was it uh, changing the amount of income coming in, changing the costs going out? Uh, or just waiting out a bad time? What were those things that you had to do to make sure it went from being unsustainable for the prior owner to clearly sustainable for you now this many years later? You know, I think uh, it's a combination of all of those. He saw, everyone, saw a, a shift in now being uh, operators, being owners. And, and you can see that trend. Like a lot of, I mean, listen, when I was starting out, there were 60 plus major studios in LA and now I think commercial studios, I think there's maybe, there's definitely less than 10 that or maybe six or five or six that you can really, really, that really survived that recession. So what happened to the other 60 studios? And I think what's happened, what, what's happened is it's owner operated uh, businesses. So the owners previously, right, they, they were businessmen. They were like, oh, this is a good business. I can charge X amount a day and blah, blah, blah. You do the math. Oh, it could be a good return on investment. Well, they realize that that's not the case anymore. And to be not in control of that is a scary thought. I can control cost. I can control everything based on even if I was even if Larrabee was private, I could control all of that because I'm the owner operator. I have control. Studio owners from the past didn't have control anymore. 
And that's why you're seeing that shift. That's why most studios now have are owner operated, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's really, really important. Now, the business side, it was just learning about cost of labor, cost of goods, you know, cost of, you know, what what's it going to take to, the, uh, you know, to hire, to hire the right people, to, uh, I wish I could take credit for it, but I do have a good team here that does that and does it well. And, and, and you just kind of try to stay out of the way and they do what they do. I do what I do. And. We have meetings about how we can improve business, how can, how we can promote it, um, and all all of that. But I got to tell you, if there was one word, if one word to to uh, in any business, especially now in the music business, would be how we adapt to the industry. And you said that, oh, that's interesting how you've been able to keep your workflow and adapt to the needs of today's needs. And that's really, really important for anyone. And I'm very conscious of that as well, is always looking forward on what's the new trend, uh, what, not not necessarily a trend, but what's, how is how is our industry evolving in all areas from studio, commercial studios, technology, obviously, on sounds, on emotion, and all of that. Just keeping your finger on that pulse is really important. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of producers, engineers, musicians out there who have that uh, instinctive understanding that I've got to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to style, when it comes to the artistry. But they may have that block of thinking, oh, I've got to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to the business. Let's look around corners and see what people are going to need a few years out. And how do we be one of those businesses that are offering those solutions that people are going to be looking for, offering services, offering the new way in which people want to work. So that's that's a whole second side of it. You got to have both of those sides working to make things work for a long period of time, I'd imagine. Yeah, man. And that's why I always talk about the left side and the right side of the brain. You know, like you got to be able to flip that switch when you need to. And, and it's, it's not easy. I mean, you know, most artists are artists. A lot of mixers, I know a lot of mixers are that are right brain thinkers and I know a lot of left brain and you know which one they like, they tend to fall the most, whether it's conscious or subconscious. But it's, uh, listen, it's really important to be aware of both. I think to be a, a good businessman in general, you gotta understand numbers, you gotta understand how to run a business, how to be a leader too, you know? Like when the moment you hire anyone, you hire an assistant, you gotta be a good role model to that to that culture that you're trying to build. And I think that that's really, really important. And and if you notice next time you're in LA, please come visit us. I mean, I feel like we have this amazing culture here that it's about creation, it's about moving forward, creative thinking, you know, client service still. We, we, I, I don't think I'm better than any anybody. I, we're still, this is a service. I'm providing a service and hopefully you like my service and call me again. Simple yeah. as that, you know. You got to um, keep winning back your customers, even if they already like you. Yeah, you know, you're only as good as your last hit. That's what they say, <laughs> and man. You, and you're and you're you're only as good as your client too. So right, that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. Uh, man, it's a lot easier to make great sounding records when you're working with great sounding artists. I'm absolutely that's sure. A hundred percent. Now, uh, how would you recommend that uh, these artisty people, creative people? who are in the music production space, that they flesh out that business side of their brain. I mean, how did you go about adding to that part of your personality? And what do you think are some of the ways that people should look about adding to that part of their, their personality and mental toolkit? You know, listen, uh, I think I don't have a, say, a formal education, uh, business education. I went to school, high school, went to music school, was a musician my you know, young in my young life. And uh, I could have gone to business school, but I didn't. I went and got a, a job as a runner at Enterprise Studios and, and it worked out really well. So I think it's a lot more difficult for someone that doesn't go to business school to learn, you know, how to read a P&L statement and how to, how to manage, you know, cash flow and all that. I think that just for me personally, just came from experience seeing other businesses, friends, listening to great podcasts, you mm -hmm. know, that, that talk about, oh man, I love, I love them. Cause there's so much knowledge out there that's, that that's shared and it's like textbooks right in front of you. So just, you know, reading about how to handle, uh, any sort of bit on the business side. And, uh, 
So I encourage anybody that has an artistic side to always, always be aware of that. And there's the tools are there. I mean, Mr. Google's he's awake 24 seven. You can ask him anything, anytime. I mean, so there's the lack of knowledge. It's not like back in 1940, you know, like it's not like the good old days. We have so many tools now right in our fingertips that, so it's just, a, I think it's more of the desire to learn it. You know, right. the desire has to come from within and some people don't want to think about it. You know, I, I know a lot of mixers, a lot of producers that, don't want to think about the business and then 10 years from now they're like man i did, i made so much money but i have nothing today you know and it's like so instead of ignoring it just embrace it and know that that is a part of a business absolutely man i think that is the biggest thing is getting past those mental blocks those roadblocks we put up for ourselves you know so many of those obstacles are are self-imposed and once you decide that you want to learn something it's not that hard to learn almost anything right I mean, Absolutely. if you were able to learn how like an SSL works or even how your DAW works, there's a lot of stuff that you can learn if you put in that time. Mm -hmm. It's just making yeah. that commitment and that shift in, in, in almost personality and self-identity because a lot of people who are in music might be telling themselves a story their entire lives. If I'm this kind of person, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not that kind yeah. of person who knows business. I'm the kind of person who does art stuff. And it's like, okay, yeah, well, that's man. that's all right. When you're 17, 18, 20, you can be a one-dimensional person. But as you age, I think you got to become a, a multi-dimensional person. A hundred percent. Yeah. And do you want to make let a 17-year-old's decisions about who you are as a person rule you for the rest of your life? Or do you mm -hmm. want to, like you said, adapt and grow and change and say, no, thank you. I'm going to let a 30, 40, or 50-year-old person make some decisions for my life now, not just listen to <laughs> who a 17-year-old thought I was and should be and what my interest should be. Yeah. So, so that's a thing. great point, man. That is, that's, that, that's it. You hit it right on the head. And I think that more producers, more engineers, artists, you know, entrepreneurs, they, they got to be aware of all these things we, we're talking about. And unfortunately, when we were growing in this business, they, they, they tell us, especially producers, we're creative. It's a creative uh, field, right? And yes, of course, it's creative. But, you know, I always say the moment you exchange a, a dollar, right, that's a business. Mm -hmm. So you might as well start thinking of it early on. And like you said, not become that 40 year old producer that turns around and says, oh, man, what happened? I was like the, the flavor of the month 10 years ago. And now I can't get, you know, I can't, I don't get any gigs. And so just being aware of that business side and shifting and know how to shift that mentality. And it's okay to, it's, it's, it's to totally doable. You, your creativity is not going to be affected by the, you know, the knowledge of your business knowledge. You just got to practice on when to turn it on and off, right? That's right. the key. Yeah, that's a great point. Now, because we have an audience of podcast listeners here, and you said you listen to a bunch of podcasts when you're trying to turn this part of your brain on, uh, can you recommend any to our current listeners, anything that has inspired you uh, less on the creative side, more on the business side? To uh, Oh, my God. This is, you know, <laughs> it's going to be really boring. All <laughs> I listen to is restaurant podcasts now, and, uh, right. and really boring stuff on how to manage cash flow in a restaurant, how to, uh, how to hire within the uh, food and beverage business, how to um, hire the right front of house, back of house. Well, yeah. let's talk about why we're, you're doing that because this may <laughs> seem like an unusual jump. I know why you're doing this, but this may seem like an unusual jump for some people listening. You have another business that you're opening that is going to be affiliated with, I think even attached to Larrabee Studios. And I think this is really interesting because I know that even when music... Uh, industry revenue started to decline in the you know early 2000s, that one thing that kind of shot up was live music, live events. People were willing to still spend money for experiences, even if they weren't shelling out as much for CDs. So you are opening up, correct me if I'm wrong, a venue, something you're working on? Can you tell us a little bit about this project? What's about? What gave you this crazy idea to do it? Just, just tell us about it. Well, yeah, definitely a crazy idea, <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know, it's it was a... I don't know, man. It, it was an opportunity to uh, to bring some live music to to LA and uh, on a level that hasn't been with uh, you know seen before, uh, at least that I haven't seen before. It's basically a supper club, and you know what 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 is a supper club? Supper club had I, what I think three, maybe more things in co uh, in common. 
they, they always had great music, great food, and great drinks, right? Mm -hmm. And people like to dress up, and it was, it, was, it was an event, right? And then you fast forward to 2020, let's just say. What would a supper club today be, right? Well, it wouldn't be the big booths. You wouldn't dress up in a tux every night. I mean, how, how has it evolved? And to me, it still has the three essential things, music, food, and drinks. So what we're trying to do is really build this culture of a supper club where you, you have a modern day cuisine, whether it's a farm to table, whether it's a fresh California, what, whatever it is, you still go there because it's really good food. And then you also go there because you have great cocktails, but also great music. So the venue is going to be literally connected to Larrabee. So I believe in bus any business, you got to have a win-win-win. So in this case, the artist, you can't just ask artists to play. I mean, to me, that's, yeah, great, but I mean... That's what well, they got to get some in return, whether it's, you know, financial return, they got to get something. So for us is content, quality content, right? There's you can capture content any day now. You can pull, put up a mic in your laptop. Right. And there it is. But to get really, really good content, quality content, then the artist is going to keep coming back. For example, if I just going to throw uh, Bruno Mars, for example, wants to do a live album. Where is he going to cut a live album? He can cut it anywhere, right? But what we're trying to say is, look, we're going to cut it at Larrabee while you play next door. Mm. And we're going to run, we're going to put a 67 in front of you and a RE20. You know, we're going to do a studio quality recording in front of 150 witnesses. Mm. You know? And that's so, essentially, we're building a studio in the restaurant where the artists get something in return, right? They win because they're getting content back. There's going to be 150 witnesses. Why wouldn't I want to be in a place where they record Bruno Mars's next live album, right? Yeah. And then our brand will grow because we just had Bruno Mars playing at our venue. You know? Yeah. So it's really a win-win-win scenario for that for everyone. And so, so, so the sound of the you know the place obviously has to be the best, you know, or one of the best. So, uh, you know, we have this incredible Meyer Sound Constellation system going up, which. It's an it's an an amazing experience, sonic experience. So even if you're on a Tuesday night and there's nobody on stage, because it's going to be well curated, um, we can have these amazing cu curated playlists. You know, we can have a, you know, we can have a playlist from you. We can have a playlist from Alicia Keys and another one from DJ Khaled or another one from the front desk girl that's a music fan. But it's a tastemaker when it comes to putting playlists together. So it's it's all it's that experience of, you know, it's human made at all times and paying attention to detail in every corner. You know, our constellation system, just to give you an idea, we have 60 speakers, eight subwoofers, you know, and still we have an array. So in no matter where you sit, you'll have this sonic experience where where you'll feel like you're in the studio. And honestly, one of the original ideas came from people coming to my studio and asking me hey play whatever you're working on and i play it for them and it changes their lives for those three minutes even mm. if they don't like the song and this is where it just clicked it's like look we live in a ear pod uh, air earbuds you know tiny tiny almost speakers in your ear uh that limit the full you know sp spectrum from you know freq frequency spectrum so when people listen to sub or or really cool top end or mids, it has a different connection, an emotional connection that you have to that song. Yeah. And that's doesn't, you know, that's why everyone everyone wants to go to a studio. You know, everyone wants to feel that experience. So I I always wanted to bring, you know, I can only fit so many people in my room. I was like, how can we make this and have 150 people feel it the same way? Because it does change. It changes your life for that moment. You know that's why we love doing what we do, and that's why we keep doing what we love to do because it's it does change your mindset. And I always say your soul almost leaves you for momentarily. You know, and that's uh, that's really powerful, really really powerful. It is amazing to watch. I mean, uh, having worked in a mastering studio for quite a while, you know, a system like that, having clients come in who've heard. The music in their own environment, maybe a home studio environment. Often they're working remotely with a mixer, so they never even had the experience of 
you know, hearing on the mixer system, and then they walk into the mastering studio and they hear their favorite records in there. It's just like the f- people who haven't been exposed to really high fidelity sound, the first time, they always say the same thing. It's like, I've heard this song so many times, I've never heard that before, you know? Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. yeah, just its ability to transport you to a different world. I like how you put it, that your soul leaves your body from it and joins that uh, <laughs> world of music, man. Yeah. So yeah. that's beautiful that you'll create that experience for people. And it sounds to me like a, it's going to be have to be a fairly kind of upscale kind of place. And I know that there's a lot of venues out there that, you know, they serve some food, they do some drinks, but the music part of it is almost this labor of love where it's so driven by bands that no one's ever heard of trying to get some of their friends to come and have dinner and drinks there at it. Uh, then there's regular people who might be patrons of the restaurant who won't go because there is just some annoying band no one's ever heard of playing there. But it sounds like you're doing not that in so many different ways. And I love yeah. that term you you said, supper club. I'm thinking all of a sudden of like Harlem in the early 20th century and like mm-hmm. the 1950s kind of vibe where people would go to see and be seen and also to have like an experience, an unusual, not everyday experience. So I'm getting the sense this is a little upscale and I won't be able to afford to go there every night of the week. <laughs> so what kind of clientele are you imagining? And you know, what kind of, uh, you don't have to be too specific if you don't want, but what kind of price ranges are people looking to, to go in to have that kind of experience? Uh, what's it gonna be like? You know, I, I always believe, you- and you know look it, it should be affordable enough that we can all go yeah mm-hmm. it's not a a michelin a three michelin star type of place where you go on your anniversary right i this place we have different sort of tiers right mm-hmm. they everyone asks us oh is it going to be members only because you know once you have that type of caliber of artists playing here it's got to be members only right uh you got to be able to uh and we never wanted to do that i mean i, I don't want to you know, there's enough Soho houses in the world now that that's not what we want to be. What we want is people that appreciate great music and are, are willing to pay, not a premium, but they had there's different sort of levels to it. One is if you want to just have a really good dinner that, that, you know, maybe not every day of the week. Another day you may just want to come for drinks. Another day you may want to impress your girlfriend, wife, friends, whatever it is, where you actually you know, buy an experience and you go into our chef's table. You know, our chef's table is gonna be a well curated menu by our chef, Paul Shoemaker, that does have a three Michelin stars, that's super high, high end quality, but that's gonna be a tasting menu that's a different price range from from inside the restaurant, you know? So there's different tiers, uh, but we don't wanna alienate, you know, uh, uh, anybody. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, as a business too, we don't want the guy sitting at the bar for four hours drinking one Bud Light and taking up that. <laughs> taking I don't up that think real Bud estate. Light should be even allowed in this place. The way you've described it so <laughs> right. far to me, I don't know if you should have that. Exactly. Anywhere. You know, it's 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 just you know we want the tastemakers to go there. You're a tastemaker. You go in. You're going to spread the word. You know, you're going to be our ambassador. You're going to you know. We, I don't believe in traditional PR for a place like this. It's all going to be word of mouth. You're going to, you're going to be willing to pay for that experience that you're not going to get anywhere else. And, and I feel like there's enough people that will want to experience that and pay maybe a higher than they they're used to. You know, sure. I mean, our our prices are not going to be food wise. They're not going to be crazy. They're going to be like going for like going to a lot of restaurants. I, I guarantee you. There's a lot of restaurants in New York that you know that are way, way more than, say, what we're trying trying to go for. And I gotta say, if there, anyone who has never been in the environment where you are in a small room with a world class artist, man, oh, it is like being on a different planet. I still remember the first time it ever happened to me. Uh, I saw Beck play at some. It's like a PBS taping. I forget what the program was called, but there was maybe 120 people in the audience, and it was the end of Beck's Odile tour. And mm. seeing a performer in his group, they had, were so tight from being at the end of that tour. It, like, my goodness, in hindsight, what I wouldn't have paid for that experience, it happened to be free. I won tickets on the radio, but I was like, oh my God, how am I here? And, you know, since then, you know, working in the music industry, occasionally you'll end up in a situation where you're in a small room with a world class artist who's singing in front of you in front of like 30 people. I've had that happen with Nico Muley, mm. with Sufjan Stevens, and, all, mm. and it's just 
man, if you haven't experienced that in that kind oh, of intimate man. environment, right. it is, it's something, those are unforgettable experiences that like haunt you for the rest of your yeah. life, you know? They really so. do. And imagine, imagine those experiences in the, in a sound system that you've never heard before, right? right. Imagine it just, it, it, the whole experience becomes even more, you know, elevated. Well, I'm sold, man. I'm going to come. I'm going to wear my bow tie. When's it opening up? Yeah. Uh, when's this, what's no the place bow called? Ties. No <laughs> bow ties. Hey, well, uh, when's the, what's the place called and when is it opening up? It's called verse as All verse right. in a poem, not yeah. necessarily a song. Cause uh, we believe in arts too. We believe in, uh, you know, our menus will have a poem in the back, you know, and it's, uh, and it's going to eventually, you know, it's going to just evolve and change. And it, it's all, tri you know, we're, acknowledging all forms of art and hopefully you know we'll i think it's uh we're slated to do fall of 2019 so nice. anyone that's in la you know please please come come check us out exciting man and i like how you're able to scratch both your creative itch and your business itch at the same time by doing something like this and even for those people who tuned to this podcast thinking we were just going to be talking about faders and knobs uh, i hope that this part of the conversation has at least given you some sense for like how you can think creatively in your own business. Maybe mm -hmm. there are things that are tangential or parallel to what you do that could just enhance the fulfillment you're getting out of life and the you know stability and the angles of revenue stream that you're able to get out of your business. Now, for those of you who did turn in, tune in mostly for faders and knobs and what have you, we got to talk a little bit more about Kick your sounds. process. You're like a major <laughs> mixer. This guy's worked with Post Malone, Bruno Mars, uh, Lizzo. I, I mentioned a whole bunch of artists at the beginning. So I got to ask you a little bit more about how you're getting sounds. First of all, if you don't mind, you have a camera there on your computer. Can you give us like a little, maybe like 180 virtual tour? Can you just point us around yeah, the studio no, a tiny yeah, bit? Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, hopefully I won't screw this up. Um, if you drop it, I'll edit it out. It's not a big deal. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's my baby right there. Nice. And what monitors are those that you have there? Those, I have uh, these Neu the <laughs> yeah, the, the Neumann uh, Twenties, uh, two, uh, four twenties. Is that it? Yeah, four twenties. Right. I haven't seen those in a lot of studios yet. Why do you oh, like you like it about they, those? They they sound so good. Uh, I was doing a seminar in France that mixed with the master, uh, and I blew their their monitors. And I uh, and they, uh, they they told me they only had these Neumanns. I'm like Neumanns. I didn't know they made speakers. So they pulled them out, and they were the four tens. Um, I believe not two tens, four tens. Um, but I just love them. So I got in touch with Neumann. They brought these in and I, and I, you know, I'm so picky when it comes to monitors and I just, I love them so much. They're doing a great job. So that's a good plug for them. If anyone's interested, <laughs> check, it, ch check them out. Hey, can we take a quick peek at your racks? Do you have some racks there yeah. near the console? Ooh, well? my rack. That's a personal thing, but <laughs> right, I'll show you my rack. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it there. I uh, see your APIs there, and I see the yeah, GML some, EQ, the Avalon, yeah. some Pultex at the bottom. Pultex, yeah, you're you're good. Uh, hey, let's see, let's go to I've this. I've been working in this field a long time, not as long as Manny Marroquin, but I've been working in it a while. <laughs> uh, some more, uh, all right, some Avalons and SSL up there. Is that the SSL Fusion up there by chance? Yeah, man. Oh, you have Ooh. to tell us about that new box. Check that out, man. I love that box. I called Peter's over at SSL few months ago I told them that that was one of the best things they've done uh lately wow all right oh. and then you got this oh, what's that manly is that a massive passive or is that something else that's a massive passive i love correct. the massive passive oh gorgeous piece and a whole bunch more api you got a second rack there more APIs with the except EQs. rack and the other these are 550b's mostly the other ones are 550a's got some quad eight some me some uh 2254 knees some back rack stuff uh, on this side, I got, let's see, some LA 2As, uh, uh, more manly stuff, the VU, CO1B, DCL 200, 33609, uh, 32264A. Um, so when are you going to get some gear in there, Manny? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to, well, I don't I, see enough of these, a TLA 100A. Yeah. I think you have the Summit TLA 100A. I know, in there. I, I love that thing, man. Yeah. I love it. I, you can compress with that thing until like the needle is pinning and it, things don't sound like over compressed. It's a really cool So, box. so musical, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Beautiful stuff. Yeah, you know the toy, you know, listen, I'm blessed enough that, to have some of these toys. Uh, but, you know, it's so funny when I was talking about the seminar mix with the Masters and 
uh, and we have like 15 participants, right? Attendees mm -hmm. and, uh, and they, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of our peers out there. Whoa, well, you can make, well, you got a 33609. Of course you can make things sound good. And then, you know, and I, and I show them on how I mix not using one single piece of gear, you know, like I will even mix one of their songs. Yeah. Uh, and I, and just to prove to them that it has nothing to do with our tools, you know these these are tools that help us. These are different colors, right? Yeah. But if you don't know what to do with it, you know, then it doesn't matter. You, you know, <laughs> so totally. I try to teach. I try to teach them to at least you know the the power of balancing alone is is probably the most powerful. I don't. It's not even a tool, but they're like, oh, one thing that you can't live without is. Well, I can live without any of this stuff, honestly. But the power of just simple balancing, and I always say, imagine a drummer, right? And he's right in front of you in a studio, and he's playing just a simple two-four beat. And just imagine going boom, ga, boom, ga, right? But that's what you're hearing. But then he's actually what you're actually balancing goes boom, ga, boom, ga, boom, ga, and that sounds unnatural. Like so, if you visualize this drummer. That's unnatural. That he wouldn't be just tapping the kick, right? So to me, then that's balancing. If I have a kick and snare, if I close my eyes and visualize the the level of the snare with the kick, that now you have a groove back, and you use you change, you know, point two, point four dB on something like that. It makes a huge difference. So the power of just balancing alone, you know, we forget how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you start getting into obviously all the other other layers, but the found you know just the fundamentals of just basic EQ and balancing and not overdoing it. I feel like we have so many plugins today and so many toys that we get lost. We don't know what to do. We're like, the GUI looks good. Let me try this plugin, and <laughs> all of a sudden you totally screwed up the sound, you know. And uh, and why do that? I, I, my style is as needed. Mm -hmm. I'm coloring, I'm t this, this. Oh, this bass would be cool if I have this color. And boom, I turn around and there it is. If I don't turn around, I can do it in the plugin. So uh, again, these are just tools to make your song connect emotionally with a listener, right? Yeah. Not the other way around. Right? Now, the 33609 doesn't make me, you know? Mm-hmm. I will tell you, uh, I know from experience that you can make terrible sounding records with great gear because I've personally done it. I mean, I remember when I was <laughs> starting off in my early 20s, working my way through like a, a hip hop studio in, in college, there was some fancy gear. I mean, we had a Manly Vox box. There was a you know, Telefunk and Elam 251, all the stuff. And I'd bring in artists I was working with on the, the weekends. And, you know, I, I remember doing stuff with this fancy equipment that just did not sound good. And obviously, I, I learned over time to make things sound better and better, but being in a room with all that <laughs> fancy stuff, it was clear to me that that was not the weakest link. The weakest <laughs> link was me, you know? And uh, uh, for those people who haven't been in a room with all that fancy stuff, you're not missing that much necessarily. I mean, the biggest piece of the puzzle is you, you know? And mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting thing when we have on presenters at our, you know, mix con event where we have people walk us you know through a real work and mix under the hood a lot of the older guys you know your age and up uh not that you're older hey anything, now hey not that you're now. old but i mean experienced Easy, guys tiger. the guys who aren't just spring chickens you know the guys <laughs> who've been around the block and have made some real records they get up there they show people oh this is everything i do here's my whole chain because they don't care if anyone knows what they're doing because they know no one else is them and no one else has their exact taste and no one else has their exact instincts and some of the younger kids you know they've worked on their you know first big record maybe in the late 20s early 30s and they're a little scared about showing people exactly what sure. tools they're using because they think oh someone can mimic my style and it's like you yeah, could man. you i could probably sit down with your exact template for your last mix and put me in front of the same console and say mix this we set up all of manny's effects sends and returns you know, all the things are there, the gain station, now mix it. And it would sound like a different person's mix because I'm a different person. Mm -hmm. And that's, exactly. that's the big thing. That's the beauty of it too. Right? You know, that's the beauty where you got 20 mixers and you have 20 completely different mixes. And that's, 
uh, I think we all give a little piece of our hearts into everything we do, and a mix is one of them. So we're in the, and, and it all depends on that day as well. Like your mood, did you get into a fight with your boyfriend, girlfriend? Uh, your kids didn't do well in school. You didn't get a good night's sleep. You have meetings. I mean, even within yourself, uh, you, you're constantly battling emotions that you're going through. So. The more you know about yourself, the better you'll be performing that mix because then you know how to flip the switch, you know, and hey, this is something that's affecting my 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 mood is affecting the mix. And that happens all the time. Everyone, I think I, everyone can relate to this. And and then and then going through this sort of roller coaster of emotions in one day doing a mix, right? You. One, uh, one moment the mix will sound amazing right and then three hours later you're like oh, i'm the worst mixer ever <laughs> you know? and then it starts to sound good again and yeah. and again why why do we do that and the psychology of it is look you felt good maybe you had a really good thought in your mind and your subconscious like you're going on vacation next week and you felt good and the mix felt good to you at that moment right there's so many things that happen within yourself that you're you become your almost worst enemy at times so knowing and realizing all those emotions that you're going through while you're mixing again it's very important because your mix will be affected and not necessarily it could be a good way or not a good way and just that information gives us tells us a lot about the approach on that particular song for that particular day and i i tend to look at all those subtle details that that we all are aware of we just don't process them the same way you know yeah no totally man very well said so i, I want to ask you another question about your process and your workflow are there cornerstone habits for you that have been essential to the way you work uh things that you really feel like i want to do on every mix to to kind of know where my center is and know where i'm going do you have a a, a bus chain that you keep coming back to do you have elements that you always start with are there any kind of things that are fundamental just to your approach and process on on the day-to-day -day. you know I, I it's fair to say that it makes pop records right mm -hmm. so whether it's john sub genre whether it's uh alternative rock r&b hip-hop or any of that it's still sort of pop mm -hmm. yeah uh so pop music today more than ever is very rhythmic based you know you can have a country song and you have it's all about the groove so being a drummer from when I was a kid and till my 20s, I always start with the drums. <laughs> I always say, you know, I always close my eyes and kind of visualize if there's live drums, I visualize that drummer in front of me. So if it's not, then I blend it the way it makes me feel a certain way to almost want, make me want to groove, not necessarily dance, but just groove, move my body, right? So I always, always start with the drums, even if there's no drums in the song, meaning that I find the groove. Once I find the groove, that's my foundation to any record, even if it's a ballad with no drums. What's something is playing a groove, whether again, well, bass line, a guitar, a string, something is playing a groove, right? And I focus on that. And I that's once I what once I'm happy with that, it could take minutes, hours, hopefully not days. <laughs> but once I'm cool with that, then I start adding the layers, you know, and if it doesn't fit the if anything, if I start adding in, instruments there, and, and it gets in the way of the groove, I do something to that sound, you know, simple as that. I don't, I don't try to change the groove now based on this new sound. So uh, there's the, uh, obviously there's exceptions to everything. But for the most part, if it gets in the way of the groove, I I study on why and analyze how I can get the sound to fit in the song without affecting the groove. And then say, it, then the vocals come in. Some people start with vocals. I t tend to move as almost the last thing I add. And then I work backwards. And then I say, once I put my vocals in there, oh, the groove doesn't feel quite as whatever I thought three hours ago felt. So then I kind of mute everything else and I do vocals and groove and once that's sitting right it, it, everything else is candy unless it's a guitar solo or something like that's more of a focal point in the song but 85 percent of the rest of the stuff is just kind of filling in the gaps you know to make it feel in f a certain way but the groove and the vocals are there 
and that's why I started with the pop music sort of. Uh, that's what if you listen to pop music today, that's if you were to pick things that are always, you know, there and uh, it's always grooving vocals, right? Yeah, absolutely. But if anything gets in the way of those two, then I then I again, I analyze it. That's when I start. Oh, let me try this plug in. Let me try this sound. Let me try a reverb. Maybe it's not sitting in the track right. Let me put an effect on it. Let me let me separate. Let me glue it. Let me unglue it. Uh, and you, that's where all of us, a uh, million things start going through your mind, right? Like there's so many thoughts that go into it on how and why. And I, the one thing I always say, does this, and this is really interesting because I say this a lot and people either understand it or don't understand it. If you were to slow down the process, <laughs> you you grab if you grab an EQ, you know you're doing it for one or two reasons. For the most part, you're either doing it to sound good, make that sound good, or make it feel good. And I think that's something that we got to ask ourselves every time we do something. You know, am I making it sound? And one is not better than the other in this case. Because let's take the bass for example. The bass is grooving, right? And then I add a little bit of low end, even more low end to it. Is that getting in the way? Is that helping my groove? Does that make my foot tap even harder or whatever? Or is it because I want to bring it out in the mix more? That's not necessarily helping the groove. It's I just want to hear the bass more, right? And I think that's really important to to recognize what, what are you which which one are you doing it for? Because you, once you say I want it to sound better, you should ask yourself is it, is it really helping the song or not? Mm. And I think that's gonna ninety percent of the stuff we do, you're not gonna do. So it's gonna be the less is more approach. I love that, and it's gonna be so counterintuitive for so many people, myself included. But I also immediately understand the wisdom in it as soon as you're saying it. And I, it's something I have to catch myself on too. I mean, I, I work at the, do, yeah. yeah, I work on the the mastering end these days, and every once in a while, I find myself turn an EQ and I'm like, am I just trying to impress myself or does the song feel better after listening to the whole thing? Dave, or am I just trying to make go. it sound right in a quick sip test where you listen to two seconds, you know, mm -hmm. oh, it's got more treble and more bass. It must be better. How's the song sound, you know? And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I love the way that you're, you're framing it is, does the whole thing feel better rather than does that element sound better? So that, that's huge. Now, another question I have to ask you is on compression. How do you approach it? I got a taste of the fact that four, five, six dB of compression in Manny Marroquin's studio is not unheard of. Uh, at least. <laughs> so how do you approach it? Are you doing mostly bus compression? Is there a place for track compression? Are you doing a multi-bus thing? Are you doing a lot of it from the main bus? What's your overall uh, thoughts there? You know what? The best There's way really no rules for that. Mm -hmm. in my Because one song, if it's a super polished pop, female, whatever, male... Uh, quote pop song that's got so many layer vocal layers and all that M it may have a multi bass multi uh, band compressor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and other times i'll take it off it really depends on the sound and the vibe they're going for so which brings me to rough mixes now right yeah. the uh some people hate them some people Actually, all people hate them, I think. <laughs> uh, so for me, for me, rough mixes are a great representation of where the song needs to kind of be. Not necessarily it needs to be the rough, but it gives you an insight on how people were thinking even without having a conversation with the artist. Back in the day, we'd spend 20, 30 minutes talking about the song and me taking notes, you know, because the artist wasn't, Europe or back east and they couldn't come out to the mix today that's the rough the rough is like here I don't we don't even have to jump on the phone for this one listen to it and you can take as many notes as you want and it kind of gives you uh, that conversation that we would have with an artist so I see those roughs as a positive of course some of them are slamming and there's the, they don't understand about luffs and all that technical stuff and it's frustrating from that point of view but as far as like the vibe and the, where the song needs to be, it gives me so much information. So I listen to the rough. I listen to the things I like about it and I listen to the things that I want to improve upon. And that's to, to me helps me out in the approach because then I know if it's a multiband, I know if it's a less compression, I know how much glue they want. 
Uh, I know how much separation, how much how much unglued they want it to be. So all these words that are really, really crucial to your stereo bus processing uh, are answered for you in the rough. You know, hmm. it's like, oh, this is a slamming mix. That means I'm going to have to slam a two bus. I'm going to have to do uh, a maybe maybe not a multi band, but a super limiter in the box uh, and and squeeze the crap out of it. You know, but how do I do it in a way that's still musical? Right. So that's the challenge. OK, what if I am at seven luffs? What you know, that's a super loud rough. How do I make it sound where it still feels loud without slamming it and with still being musical and having dynamics? You know, because, of course, dynamics is super, super important for me, at least to to incorporate into any song. So so it, it's funny because I, I don't have one way of doing it. And that's, I think, the most exciting part of my my job now that I'm doing from an alternative song in one room and a trap song in the other room keeps it exciting, uh, not knowing what I'm going to do next, because I do I my approach is as needed. I don't have any sort of templates like this is my bass template, my drum ox. And I do have templates, say, for effects. This is my quarter delay, my eighth note delay, so, and my reverbs and stuff like that. Yes, I encourage everyone to have those so you can the work flows quicker. But if you're finding yourself running it, running all your drums through the same bus, uh, ox, then then to me, that's I don't want to say cheating is not, but it's kind of like not working hard for it. I want to work hard for it. So therefore, I clean slate on the stereo bus and then I as needed the rough. Sometimes they'll send me their stereo bus and they'll use plugins that I'll actually leave and I'll tweak them as I go along, you know. So it's 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 an interesting and to me go I know I'm going on about this it but good. Im, imagine back in the day if you play guitar through a wawa pedal right mm -hmm. and then you send me the file without the wawa pedal and it's like oh do your own wawa and I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way yeah you know? or or distortion like no send me the distorted part that's a production call mm -hmm. so leave it on there a lot of times today when people are doing rough mixes the stereo bus is part of your production mm. it is part of that because it's like let's slam the crap out of let's do this oh this that's in a way part of that production process still right. so why why am i going to take that off why am I, why am i going to deconstruct that mix by taking that ozone or whatever that sometimes we don't like off well that was a production that's the same thing as you sending me the guitar without the wawa pedal Mm. Let me send me the Wawa pedal and let me mess with that sound and maybe incorporate it, incorporate it into this vibe as opposed to me doing my own Wawa pedal. Right. And that's the that's a simple approach as far as like two to, you know, stereo bus processing from the rough to what I'm doing. Interesting. Wow. And so when you're often, when you're getting the rough, you're getting multi-tracks with their effects on. So you can really look under the hood of their production. Yes. Those are, are those specific things that you're asking for that people are um, uh, uh, not expecting to, to, to hear you ask for? Uh, do you have like a, a checklist of stuff that they've got to send? You? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And some, some of them, it confuses them. They're yeah. like, I want two things. I want, just as you left it, I want that. I want to see, like you said, under the hood. Mm -hmm. I want to see what you're doing so I can analyze and hopefully help you with that. And then we, we'll ask for the Ableton session or the Logic session or stuff like that. So that if if you've committed to something, if they don't want to send me their broke, broken down session, if they want to, they sometimes people will print stems because uh, they thought I love the way this sounds. That's like again the Wawa pedals printed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I still ask for the logic session because if I'm mixing it and I'm like, man, I wish that wasn't as compressed because I could have more life in this section even. Mm -hmm. I don't mind the hooks being compressed, but in the verses, it just feels whatever that word is. And then I can grab my guy. He'll go in it and take the compression off. And then I have it untreated. So it gives me a lot of flexibility, you know, if I if, if needed. And so I, so we ask for both Ableton or Logic or whatever, whatever DAW you're running. We ask for that session and your Pro Tools session. Beautiful. I'd never really heard of uh, that approach before, but it makes a lot of sense, uh, especially today, when 
the production is more and more one of the instruments that's being used uh, in yeah. the process of creating these tracks. Wow, so re really great to hear you put it that way. You must have uh, basically every single plugin in the universe at this point. <laughs> I got a ton, <laughs> yeah. I got a lot, way too many, let me tell you, way too many. I only need to use one and that's called the Manny Mariquin Signature Series and that that's mm -hmm. all, the, that's the only one I ever need to use. Yeah. Just kidding, uh, <laughs> shameless plug. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plug, Turum. A plug for your <laughs> plugs, man. We can plug your plugs on this show. Why not? <laughs> not necessary, but thank you. <laughs> uh, so that must have been an interesting experience designing plugins uh, with Waze. How long did that whole process take? Oh, geez. Uh, it, it took a long time, man, because uh, Waves may not be happy me saying this, but this is from the horse's mouth. It, uh, you know, they wanted me to do something that I wasn't comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's no blame to them or no criticism or anything. But they had their vision of what a signature series plugin was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I had my own version of it. Mm. Uh, I did it self. <laughs> I was pretty selfish with it because <laughs> I was like, wait, you want to do a plugin? Ah, oh, sucker. <laughs> All right, let's go. I wanted to do, uh, like, for example, my EQ, right? Uh, I wanted to. You saw my Avalon 2055, and I yeah. love the top end on that, right? But I only have two of them, one's in the shop. I have a pair here, but if I wanted, if I'm running it through the desk and I needed four of them and I only have two, then I got to compromise somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, what, how cool would it be if I take every sort of go-to piece of gear in my room and specifically every frequency that I do, because I know I like the top end from the Avalon. I know I like the mid from this one and the low end from that one. What if I create a, like a, a an EQ on steroids, right? So every frequency is a different band of a, a piece of gear in my room, mm. right? So that's what that EQ is. Well, uh, unfortunately, I don't think they promote it quite like that, but I wanted that to to be able to have unlimited 2055s in my room, you know? So I was like, and then at one point they didn't want to do that. And, you know, so it, it took a long time when we were on and off and on and off. And then finally, thankfully, they they believed in the uh, utility-based plugin than, than the other, which would be more instrument-based. Like, this is a base processing. And I'm like, you know, I feel like, uh, users are too smart for that today, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to do it more on the higher end. You know, if you're doing a quick rough mix and, and it helps you pull up a bass plugin and then you just do a preset and it helps you great. I mean, that's, that's, that's a great tool. But for me, that wasn't the intention to me. It was, uh, let's carve more, let's do more of a, you want to make the tool, tool you would actually use. It exactly. Like. Yeah, I hear That's you. exactly what it is. You know, it would take five pl five pieces of gear for me to put distortion on a ping pong delay, where I was like, okay, well, my delay will have distortion on there already, and I put a phaser and a harmonizer and a reverb, and it's all in one. So it takes me instead of five minutes to create, it takes me literally ten seconds. Right. So so I created them for me, and I was like, you know, I was like, hey, look, if people dig it, great, but I. W my goal was not to sell plugins. My goal was to have those tools at my disposal at any time. And, you know, thankfully it's gotten a great reaction. You know, people still use them and they get a lot of great feedback online and emails and all that, so. Do you ever have a pleasant uh, surprise when you're working on a mix, they send you the entire track and then your plugins are somewhere <laughs> in the session? Does that ever happen? Yeah, man. The first time that ever, first time I saw that, it was one of the happiest days. I was like, <laughs> what? No way. <laughs> it was such a good experience, such a good feeling with knowing that someone was actually using my plugins, you know. Yeah, uh, I had no idea it was going to be like that. And I still, the session I got today, the stereo bus had my plug in, you know, so it's kind of cool. You know? so, now, yeah, as, as just... a guy who has a ton of hardware and a hardware based setup and pretty much uh, every plug in under the sun, apparently, are there any particular things where you often don't get what you want out of hardware and you're always looking to a plug-in to do that kind of thing? Are there any tasks in the studio where you routinely Listen, find yourself going to software? I mean, multi-band, like we were saying, multi-band, I mean, there's not a plug-in that can do that. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm hardware. I'm not a piece of hardware that piece. can do it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and if, they, if there's one that exists, they don't do it as well. And I love some of those presets too, some of those... Man, I mean, that's like the best... Talk about the best of both worlds, right? I mean, some 
it's so funny some of these like the decapitator that's so easy to just put across something and it's fast and it's musical and i mean it's to me having been having seen the analog world you know came from the other side and uh it's such an exciting time if you know if you know what you're looking for if you know what tools to use what an exciting time man as exciting as ever as ever in my career to be able to have all these colors right in front of you that's the positive the negative is there's too many colors for people that don't know what they want you know and that's i feel like a lot of the times there's a lot of up and coming producers, mixers that are hurting their productions and mixes more than they're helping by thinking they're doing something good to it. You know, most common mistake is when they're tracking engineer trying to mix the song and he couldn't really nail it. They send it to me and I remove their 10 plugins on that one track and it sounds way better when I remove everything. It's like, whoa, well, there's that's your problem. You're putting too much shit on it, you know, then you're you're missing the whole point. You know, it's like I come again from an analog, organic uh, musician, less is more, you know, and then and, and, and as needed. And some of those sounds may need help. We'll do something to those sounds. But I'm just more about the organic. How I learned how to the art of EQing. I learned by miking. You know, we used to sit there and work on these hair bands, you know, back in the early 90s and spend a week um on drum sounds for the album and we eq with the mics on placement on how angled and just the room and talk about the art of eqing with microphones that's how i learned how to eq like we had these walkie talkies like okay on the kick that re20 move it two inches to the left boom and then you run back in and you hear it and it's like okay you hear how it's popping here i need a little you know essentially the producer was EQing with those microphones placements. There was no EQing it. It was we we were moving mics and man, that the, to, for me, I was so lucky to have my ear tuned into the subtleties of that sound based on frequencies, based on microphones. So then the easiest thing was to apply it to an EQ, you know, because right. uh, I didn't have to run around and like move mics or change mics and all that. So I encourage everyone, anyone, to uh, learn the art of mic techniques, even if you don't use them as as a tool on how do you how to learn to EQ. Mm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now, speaking of uh, running around and assisting on sessions, you are kind of living the dream, sir. I mean, you started uh, there <laughs> as a runner. So this is the last thing I want to ask you for today. Uh, just your path through the industry you started out as a runner i imagine you then were assisting then you were tracking engineer and at a certain point you ended up as it only makes sense for me to mix now so i'm basically just mixing and then also studio owner so there's so many people who have started out as runners who have not ended up there in the chair with a name that most people who know about mixers know this guy what do you think are those things that went right in your path or that you did right that maybe some other runners who didn't make it to this end stage? <laughs> what are some of those defining factors of those people that make it all the way from one end to another instead of fizzling out or going off into some other career? You know, it's a few things, but I'll, I'll try to simplify it as best as I can. Uh, first of all, I always wanted to be a mixer since I was 15. I discover my... You know, I won't bore you with the story, but I discovered the art of mixing at a very young age when mixing wasn't even cool. You know, it was the, the dude with long hair with a cigarette and, you know, in the session, right? The typical engineer. So, but I, uh, it was such an amazing discovery that you can create emotion with frequencies, right? That to me still to this day messes, messes me up because it's so such a powerful tool so um the the assisting the engineering and all all of those were there were steps to hopefully make me a better mixer Mm. so eventually i started mixing really really young and i had thankfully success some success really really young uh but it was always that was my goal always 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 uh how why do other guys don't make don't make it to the quote you call it the, the hot seat right right uh i think a lot of it has to do with uh I've, I've met a lot of people over the years at assistant while I, w- I was assisting that didn't have a drive you know there's a lot of a lot of people that get in the industry they love the idea of it right 
but they don't know the sacrifice and the uh, the amount of hours that you, you you it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle, and some people are not prepared for that. That takes out fifty percent, if not more, of the people that work in studios or want to do it. You know, and it really tests you to the limit. And I don't think some people are made for that. Uh, I always say you got to get used to rejection. And if you can't take re rejection well, then it's probably not your. You know, if you can't adapt, you're you're gonna you're gonna be crushed because mm -hmm. there there's gonna be more people that are going to reject you, <laughs> reject you. And if you can't handle it, you're not gonna be able to have a career. That takes out twenty more percent, right? You know, listen, I've been doing this for 20, over 25 years. Sometimes I'm the first guy here and the last guy to leave still. I got a, a great team, but I had to get more assistance because I was literally killing their careers before they started because I have this incredible amount of energy and drive and passion. So, again, passion. A lot of these kids don't have the same type of passion. So there's, you know, there's only so many seats available too. You know, none of us are giving them up anytime soon. <laughs> so you almost got to be better than some of these, uh, some of these other guys. You know, this elite group that have been doing it for so many years. I think that there's a very good reason why they've been doing it that long. And there's, uh, there's really, it's just a combination of personalities as well a lot of the times some of these kids have a bigger ego than <laughs> than the established ones and you as you know once you have re so much rejection your ego has to be removed so ego is a big thing for me uh, uh the moment your ego is engaged you stop learning you know right. you completely stop learning so for me is like the moment you remove the ego then i want to learn from young cats that that i really want to know what they're thinking and i want to adapt to them you know, and I want to be in the room with the, the hot young producer. And I want that producer to teach me a few things. They come in the room. They're like, oh, my gosh, man, you mixed da 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 when I was 12 years old. Doesn't make me feel good. But uh, <laughs> but I'm like, great. And they're almost like they want me to lead. And, and they find that I want them to lead so I can learn from them. So it's almost like selfish for me, a <laughs> selfish act. You're basically work drinking the, the blood and life force of the innocent to become a better mixer every year. Yeah, hell like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So I man, suck all the energy. That's interesting though, yeah. because you know people don't think about that way. But even for you now, you know, Manny Marikin at this stage in your career, you've worked on a ton of great stuff. You're going to work on a ton of great more stuff. You probably, I imagine, deal with some rejection now, where there are probably some mixes you wish you had done this year that went to some other mixer. So it never ends. Perhaps a hundred percent. You know, and and I I I always say I've learned more uh, from the mixes that were rejected that the ones have be that have become big hits because it really still stings and it hurts and, and it hurts in a different way for me now is it's almost like criticism, you know, it's like some people take criticism really bad. And to me, I try to take it as constructive criticism. That means that I can actually learn something from this. So the fact that you rejected this mix and got one of my peers and buddies to do it and they, they did did it better to me is another sense of humility and uh, you know and that's uh and ego checked again and and a time to learn so i think that i'm gonna continue to do that till the day i stop doing it because if the moment i think i'm better than anybody else that's the moment we'll, we will fail because that's it, you continue to do and, and all my peers will say exactly the same thing it never ends so might as well get used to rejection at a very young age because it's going to continue for the rest of your career. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and I don't see it as a negative thing. No, it's a good thing, you know, and sometimes when I see people early in their careers and they're not succeeding enough, I always think to myself, well, if, you know, at a certain point I learned if you want to succeed more, you got to get rejected more. And uh, yeah, if you're not yeah. succeeding enough, maybe it's because you're not getting rejected enough. So you really got to put yourself out there and keep on going back out. And I like that thing you said about work ethic because every once in a while I think people do get attracted to this business because they think they can do this instead of working. And then they realize <laughs> that there's a lot of work. Right. <laughs> if, especially if you want to be one of the people who are doing it uh, 25 years or more uh -huh. later. Yeah. Well, Take sex, drugs, and rock and roll out of the equation. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Well, Manny, speaking of working, I'm sure you're a busy guy and you got so much more stuff to do today, but I appreciate it. you taking some time uh, to spend with us today. This was huge. You yeah, told us about uh, your approach to the craft. You told us about your thoughts on the business side of it. Man, treasure trove of stuff. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with us, Manny. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And please have me back whenever whenever you want. Whenever, you know, I love doing this. I love talking about what we do here. And if it can help anybody, please, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'd love to have you on. Big, quick uh, thanks and shout out to our sponsors before we say goodbye to you guys too. Big thanks to Sound Toys. He mentioned the Decapitator plugin. It's one that a lot of guys use. If you have never tried it out, try it out for free over at soundtoys.com. They make really awesome stuff. They've been sponsoring this podcast since the very beginning. So big shout out to Sound Toys. Check them out, soundtoys.com. Also, Eventide, making software and hardware effects for 40 or more years and making really cutting edge forward looking stuff the whole entire way. Check them out, eventideaudio.com. Crazy next gen stuff like fission where you can break open the transient and sustain of the signal and affect them separately. Fun effects like black hole and mangled verb. Last, certainly not least, Plugin Alliance sponsoring for the first time this week. Plugin Alliance is a really interesting brand where they so many brands are underneath that umbrella like Brainworks, like SPL, like Mag Audio, and they're doing recreations of really interesting hardware units and some really forward-looking stuff, especially in the Brainworks line of you know digital MS stuff that you couldn't do in an analog device. Uh, some really cool stuff over at uh, Plugin Alliance. Check them out at PluginAlliance.com. Thank you one more time to Manny Marikeen. Thank you guys for joining us for the Sonic Scoop podcast. See you next time.